Welcome to the Independent Artist Podcast, sponsored by the National Association of Independent Artists. Also sponsored by Zapplication. I'm Will Armstrong, and I'm a mixed media artist. I'm Douglas Sigworth, glassblower. Join our conversations with professional working artists. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody, folks, artists everywhere, here where we are back at the podcast, uh, Douglas. Yeah? <sighs> What's going on? What's going on? Uh, well, we're trying to fit this in today. You know, we tried yesterday and we had some technical difficulties and thanks to our guest's daughter, she was able to fix it. So we're going to redo. We're going to be able to record with our guest and my dream guest, uh, Bill Kidd today. So I'm oh, really excited nice. about that. Bill Kidd's got a little in-house tech support. Uh, he's another one of the rock stars of our community and and proud to have him on and uh, the elusive Bill Kidd. How Bill about Kidd. that? Yeah, heck yeah. yeah. That sounds awesome. <laughs> I, I love that guy. Yeah, uh, excited about that here in a minute. Yeah. We got a few minutes to catch up before we we bring him on to the show, Douglas. That sounds good. Uh, everything going good in your world? You and Renee getting ready for your first shows? and, and um... It's been total studio time and loving it. I was thinking about this today. Being back in the studio, people might have different feelings about getting to work on your art and everything. But for me, it's just like I get to play all day with one of my favorite people out there in the studio. So it has been such a pleasure the last few weeks just to be back at it and doing our thing. Nice. So. That's that's awesome. And uh, Renee's feeling invigorated, too, probably uh, from having a little bit of a break. Yeah. And, uh, getting out there and, and making some good work. I can't wait to see what you're working on. One thing that we are struggling with, you know, I often bring up equipment woes on the podcast here, but just because that's the nature of my medium. Sure. Initially, when we built our studio, I built all the equipment myself. And so the last piece of equipment, it's this little oven. It's about the size of two shoeboxes, and it's dedicated to picking up our color or heating up our color Okay. Uh, that we use in our glass. And it's like critical. It's supposed to get the glass to 950 degrees so that when we stick it at the end of the blowpipe and put it into a 2000 degree oven, we don't have glass exploding everywhere. Gotcha. So that has been a total pain because- it is inconsistently turning off on us at you know bad times and all that kind of stuff. And we can't make our work when the color oven doesn't work. So sure. uh, that's been a pain in my ass. But uh, figuring it out and maybe uh, me and Bill can do a little equipment talk here in a few oh, minutes. Oh, that'll be a, fascinating that... for everyone. Uh, yeah, <laughs> trust me. We're all going to love that. Uh, maybe we could talk about that off of the air. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Uh, the check. That, that's good. Yeah, we'll do that. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> How about you? Uh, What's going on over in Santa Fe? Uh, you know, I thought it was interesting. I was thinking about your first two shows coming up. We share the first mm. one. I'll, I'll see it on Main Street there in, in uh, Fort Worth. Right on. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Something kind of struck me. You guys are mm -hmm. setting your year up. You're a little bit rusty. You've got the first two shows in a row where you don't necessarily have to set up a tent, do you? I mean, you're into the big top of other people's tents. That could be a pro, but it's also a con because every year it's like a new a new puzzle. I mean, I've done both of the shows that I'm doing. We're talking Jazz Fest and Main Street, Fort Worth. la ti da um, Look how fancy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> show drop. Oh, Boop. show dropping. Look at you. That is sexy. That's a sexy lineup, my friend. All right. <laughs> it is it. All right. Totally. Continue. But um, I've done it enough times, not to humble brag here, but to know what I'm up against. Yeah. This time, I've kind of thought ahead. I don't set my entire tent up. I have a trim line, but I need the framework oh, do you? in order to put the rest of my booth together. Right. Not so much Main Street, but more so Jazz Fest. There are obstructions that you don't get a full 10 by 10. Well, Main Street, it, it depends. It, it can get a little tight. I've got a couple of pieces yeah. of advice after you finish here. Oh, okay, sure. Um, well, one thing I tried was I called Flourish and asked if they ever make any like custom bars that, you know, are six inches shorter. And they said, we will make you custom pieces. So I ordered those up and hopefully that's going to be my fix this year that I'll be able to have a shorter framework, maybe like a nine and a half by okay. 10 foot booth. And we're going to give that a shot and see how that works. So what we're talking about, folks, if you have not done the show, the, the crux of the show takes place there on Main Street under their big tops. Mm -hmm. And uh, you 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 put your booth in there and they give you a 10 by 10. It's a tight 10 by 10. I don't, I'll tell you what I do. I've never set a tent up under their tent. I've never done it. It seems like a weird concept, doesn't it? A tent in a tent? <laughs> I 
I mean, it does, right? But everybody yeah. feels like they've got, I mean, you need your structure in order to set up your walls. Like you, sure. you, you need that. Uh, you mm-hmm. need to have that. To, that's the way your display is. I personally, I'm just a pro panel guy. There seems to be like a support under their big top every year where I can just use my spreader bars and jam it up and tighten it all up and, and get mm-hmm. it all very sturdy. And we all talk about like these different configurations. Typically, I like to give my my people an exit. I don't like mm-hmm. to cram them in. But at that particular one, it's like, you know, when you're under somebody else's tent, it's like, I call it a horseshoe display, right? It's like nine pro panels, three on the left, three on the back, three on the right, just a horseshoe. And it's like, there's my display. Um, yep. I'll light it up, make it as welcoming as I can and and try to draw the people in. But if you don't have a corner, there's no place for them to escape. And that's just the way it way it is, you know? Right. Yeah. It also seems like with those tents, if you can get your pro panels or whatever walls you're doing high enough that it meets with the, you know yes. what I mean, the framework of the tent, then you won't have like water rushing in when you close up for the night. So right. that's that's always been a thing. So yeah, I don't need the top or the canopy or sure. whatever to make it work. So And yeah. it only works for you if you have the extenders on your pro panels. I've got the the um 30 inch tall uh extenders that you know you take those little bullets in the tops and so it goes like a full what almost nine feet I guess it is. And yeah. And so that brace is right underneath the lip of what their tent is typically. So um that's how I I deal with it and and man nine pro panels and all of my artwork and no tent. I, I feel like, a, yes. I feel free. You could show up in a Volkswagen. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking setup. about? Honestly, I'm thinking about, uh, I've, I drive a Jeep around town, just a Jeep Wrangler. And I was thinking about oh, right. pulling a small trailer down there and just okay. doing that instead of renting. It's like uh, renting for that in South Lake because I got South Lake uh, mm-hmm. the following weekend. Got a double there. So I'll need, you know, everything. God, I'm I'm almost thinking about just a small trailer and pulling it. Can you imagine? How- you know how to drive that thing, right? <laughs> yeah, I know how to drive that thing. God damn right. I'll teach you how to drive a trailer. I'll back it through a camel's eye. What camel's eye? What? Uh, yeah, easy? I don't know that it's phrase. But yeah, no, it's not. I'm, I'm turning into my uncle who used to mix his metaphors. I'll drive it right. through a camel's eye. No. no. My dad would laugh about that. It's easier to fit a camel through a needle's eye than it is a rich man into the gates of heaven. That's that is a Bible for. reference for anyone who does not sure. know. <laughs> you know our Bibles. We've all. Hey, I, I wanted to. I wanted to bring up from last episode. Remember when I was saying, "Oh, I got to get my booth shot before I head out to the first show." Yeah. And you're like, "Well, it's seventy degrees now, but you're going to be bitching next week when there's a foot of snow on the ground." Yep. You might be a little bit psychic there, sir. <laughs> there's a foot. Of, there's a foot of snow on the ground. There'll be no booth shots before I leave in a couple of weeks here. Okay, only because I listened to my wife. Uh, I told her I was like, "Well, it's spring, huh?" And she was like, "Like, simmer down, Virginia boy. This is New Mexico. <laughs> it's a different world, you know. Uh, it yeah. is never. Uh, we've never had spring break that it did not snow. Uh, the yeah. ski hill up in Ski Santa Fe got." 42 inches of fresh powder just in the last 72 hours alone. Wow. So they're not they're not shutting it down just yet. So everybody okay. all the all the youngins are are having a nice uh ski e spring break. Yeah. I used to say if it snowed during spring break, for every day it snowed, you get an extra day of spring break. My kids huh. don't realize how much I hated school. Like I really like if they were like, "Hey, can I not go?" I'd be like, Fuck, "Yeah, absolutely." But they do so great. <laughs> they do so well at school. They've got great grades. They're crushing it. And I'm like, don't listen to dad. Don't ask dad how he feels. Right. You wasted your homework. Rots your brain. Well, man. Hey, uh, so uh, something else I wanted to bring up is, I, you know, I like to talk about stuff outside of art shows that kind of inspire me. But this kind of ties back into the whole art show life. And that is a documentary or a series I watched on Netflix And it's one of those shows that talks about like you are what you eat, I think is the title of it. Mm. And it's a pro-vegan documentary. And it it shows like just how awful meat is and, you know, those kinds of foods are are for the human body. And sure. And so I happen to be on a health kick these days. Like last September, I decided that if I'm going into the second surgery, I want to try and kind of clean up my diet. And just get in a place where I'm lighter on these feet of yeah, mine. Yeah, definitely. You did not honestly coming out of that that first one. You you came back to it like 
that 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 good foot or the foot that you were you were dragging yourself around on yeah. was was working overtime. You it put was. on a couple of LBs. LBs, you, bro. You know. So yeah. anyway, so it's already <laughs> been on my mind, and we thought we would check this out, and it was fascinating. But it, then it made me think about how over the years I have times where I was a little more diligent with my you know eating clean, and then other times. But what often derails me is heading out to shows. I mean, how hmm. do we maintain a healthy? lifestyle with the kinds of foods we want to eat on the road. Do you ever have, um, do you struggle with that? Or you probably have never even had to worry about <laughs> that ever in your life. <laughs> I have. Sure. I, yeah. you know, if you are what you eat, I might be a breakfast burrito, but there you um, go. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you do try to, you know, I, 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 my blood pressure is a little bit high. I'm 53 and, uh, you know, I got to get the, the blood work done here for my physical this, this week, actually. And, Mm-hmm. It's funny you you say all of that, but like, there's a great line and I've, I've used it here on the show before. But diesel smoke and diner fries, we won't be young for long. Mm. Uh, it's old Slade Cleave song talking about yeah. being on the road. And I I love radio and I love love music and and I love putting together playlists and things. So many artists have song, whether it's even, you know all the way back to Bob Seger and Turn the Page. You know, all these artists singing about being on the road and how hard it is. And a mm-hmm. lot of it is the, you know, the, you know, you don't get to eat the way you want to eat. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I've got my, my cooler kit. Uh, okay. I, I typically eat pretty healthy during the show and then just do whatever the hell I want it at yeah. night. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you're at a busy show. You don't really have that time to eat that much, but you need your fuel, right? But, mm-hmm. like, there have been times when Renee and I would, it felt like it was like a whole day where we would prepare food for the weekend and pack like this massive camping cooler full of stuff. There's just certain things that we like to have that are healthy, and it was great to have it accessible when we're there. But it's just another thing to add to the list it when is. you're trying to get the hell out the door. Yeah, I mean, that's why I get my, I have my like mental cooler kit. I'll do like a big thing of hummus, a thing of baby mm-hmm. carrots. I've got mm-hmm. the the waterproof Tupperware thing that can sink down to the cooler so you don't mm-hmm. get cooler water in your food. Mm-hmm. There's nothing nastier than cooler water. Like, no. that's just, you know. No, that's so gross. It's so disgusting. You, you open up your hummus and you got like a half an inch cooler water. Mm, I've, I've been offered that by another artist. Hey, you want some hummus? And then they dump the cooler water off top. And I was like, no, I don't want any uh... <laughs> nasty ass. Because the outside of your, you know, your IPA bottle and your everything else. But. No, I don't know. A big thing of hummus, some baby carrots, and uh, uh, some goat juices or whatever, and and uh, call it a day. <laughs> you got to give a shout out to uh, one of our guests from last season, uh, Julia Gilmore. One night after a show, she was telling me she's going back to her room with her hot plate and broccoli. And I mean, she's making a full meal on a hot plate back in her hotel room to stay healthy. I, I mean, I love that she had that dedication. It was like, I eh. wish I could have been that, you know, <laughs> focused or eh. diligent. All right, here's how I feel, honestly. And maybe it's not very good for my health. But if I'm traveling to these different places, I want to see what they got. And I There's that too. Absolutely. You want to experience it. You know, and we have our, our special spots and it's like, I know if I'm going to Fort Worth, I'm probably going to the Flying Saucer. I'm going to have a couple of beers and a burger. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's not the best for me, but um, either are art shows. And, you know, life is life. You got to do this life. shit. Right. <laughs> Just, you know, how are you going to? I don't know. So, no, I'm not going to eat the steamed Yeah. whatever. But, I, you know, like we talked last week with a stand up and live. That's been something that I haven't done since like two or three years ago is I am such a good cook and I love to cook and I've been cooking again and it's been something fun that Renee and I can share and try new meals and I really encourage people if you get in a in a rut start making new meals that's a good way to find inspiration right there it works New for York me. Times that's what that's me baby New York Times cookbook thing whatever that app is I use that all the time try to oh, try awesome. to work Perfect. new stuff in that's uh they don't put any crap on there that and just tacos tacos are the best way to eat anything Absolutely. Like there's a tortilleria right around here. And it's like, I get a big pack of tortillas, make some pico de gallo. And then just, then it's like, well, bean tacos one night and shrimp and then fish. And, you know, uh, let's get Bill the Kid yeah. in here, shall we? Yes, we shall. Billy the Kid, let's bring let's him on. Let's get him in here. <laughs> All right. We have Bill Kid, ceramic sculpture artist, the man, the myth, the legend, coming up next after this quick break. This episode of the Independent Artist Podcast is brought to you by Zap. 
the digital application service where artists and art festivals connect. Douglas, I'm thrilled this week that we are being sponsored and supported by Zapplication.org. It's really great that they appreciate what we're doing here on the podcast. And I appreciate what they are doing, basically because I feel like I am an intensely lazy man. And they make <laughs> the entire art show process signing up for shows a lot easier. And you know, they have that tagging feature for us. Uh, that way we can put little notes about a show to help us maybe with building that perfect tour. Or you can write whatever you want on it. You can write, hey, this show sucked last year, but it had promise. Huh? It's going to be exactly what you need it to be. And I appreciate that extra bonus feature. Yeah, me too. Bill, we're so happy to see you. We're so glad you could join us on the podcast this week. Well, I'm really glad you guys are having me on. It's one of those ones Douglas mentioned your name to me. And I'm like, oh, my God, how how do we not have you on in the first like I don't know, two or three that we had on. You've, you've been uh, kind of a fixture in, in our art show world for a long time and kind of one of our rock stars, really. I mean, you've Definitely. been out there doing this. Well, you know, that's very kind of you to say. I I kind of feel like I'm just kind of a humble potter and I've had a lot of good fortune in this career and uh, it's nice to get to get the respect from you guys. Oh, so man, thank you. you're, you're, you're great. How long have you been doing this, Bill? You know, I've been doing shows for about 37 years. Holy crap. Wow. Yeah, long time. I Back in the beginning, though, I, I was teaching school, so I didn't do as many shows as I've done in the last, you know, the first 10 years, I was kind of just getting my feet wet in the business. And then the last, you know, started really kind of envying everyone's uh, traveling around the country and doing this for a living. And I continued with my teaching career and just kind of kept doing more and more shows along the way. And now that I'm retired, I'm just really, really doing it a lot. How quickly did that uh, did that wear off that uh, that envy? <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because uh, I I really was very envious. I'd do a lot of shows in Florida that were only maybe three hours from my home, mm. and I would leave Friday after work and do the show, and then get back Sunday night, go to work again. And oh, wow. I know everyone else was kind of taking it easy on Monday and this and that, but. Yeah, you know, I, we've always called those Mondays that kind of Mack truck Monday, just a full body hangover, really. Mm -hmm. Just every everything <laughs> kind of hurts, and man, I, I don't envy you uh, getting right back into into work and, and into that teaching kind of grind. And were you teaching ceramics, or what were you? I did teach ceramics, so I kind of ran my program like a college level class, even though it was high school. Okay. I'd get the kids going on projects. I may, always made sure when I had a show that weekend that they were in the middle of a project. So Monday morning, I didn't have to tell them too much. They mm. could come and get their materials and continue <laughs> on while I'm trying to wake up. That's smart. <laughs> they knew what to do. Yeah, they just come yeah, in there and they, get well, to work. Somewhat. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Oh, cool. So the one thing we've talked about on the podcast, oftentimes, and I know this is more like on the college level, so maybe it doesn't apply but the whole idea of doing art shows is something that maybe like a college art teacher wouldn't encourage or maybe wouldn't even advocate that it's a legitimate type of place for us out here. I mean, did you ever have any of that push and pull with that, with how you felt about this being an educator and, you know, doing shows outside? Well, you know, I, I was actually very fortunate. Uh, when I went to school, uh, I studied with John McCoy. He was my ceramics professor, and he actually... He wasn't the type of person that, that was all academic and saying, oh, you just got to do galleries or, you know, th that's not a viable way to sell your work or present your work. And he actually did some shows himself. I know he always talked about doing the Piedmont Park show in Atlanta, like a oh, nine day wow. show. And, and he kind of got me into looking at that as a possible way of, of selling my work or getting my work out there. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of fortunate that way. So, you know, had I had a professor that sort of poo-pooed that idea of doing shows, I may not ever have gotten into this business. Who knows? I think that's interesting because what you, you do with your work is that it is very sculptural, not a traditional what you'd see ceramicist on the street kind of with, with mugs and plates. And right. I, I'm certainly not not down downplaying that at all. It's just uh, not what we see out of your work. It, it does seem like more of a, a, a kind of a headier... Uh, gallery or something, you know, you, you certainly could have transitioned into that instead, I think. Yeah. I, you know, it's a possible that I could have gone a different route, but I think I was always kind of a down to earth kind of humble person. You know, I was a hard working person and actually from thinking back to an earlier part in my life, 
uh, my mother actually did craft fairs, but she did mm. these country craft fairs. So oh. I think some of that, I just knew that she'd go out on the weekend and she would have all this product that she made and she sold it. So I think some of that might've been ingrained in me that way too. Okay. And being clay, you know, it is a craft to some degree. And mm -hmm. when I was learning in college, I was learning about how to make mugs and plates and bowls and jars and things like that. So early on, I got, got, got into this art fair business and, uh, you know, I wanted to be able to sell my work and I, and make, cause you can produce a lot of it when you're making small things and, yeah. You know, that's probably how it all came about, really. When I first met you in the early 2000s, I remember we had a conversation about when you made that shift from kind of focusing on functional work to what you're making now or, you know, more sculptural work. And you had said, I'm just having so much fun with it. I'm so glad I made that shift. And I don't remember when it happened or can you talk about when you kind of made that yeah. change? It was going on probably about 20 years ago, more or less. Okay. I've been, you know, the first time I got my hands dirty with clay was about 40 years ago. Mm. And I never did, in a, in a sense, functional work. I did decorative, like, pottery forms. I, I would do jars and vessels and things that were carved. They, they looked more utilitarian, but they were still kind of decorative. Mm -hmm. um, and then one day after, say, 20 years of just throwing pots and doing these decorative things, I took some of these thrown forms. And just started altering them and playing around. And it was very fun. I started seeing all these organic shapes and and organic kind of possibilities of things that were kind of coming out of that. More kind of fruit and uh, vegetable seed-like maybe in the beginning. And it seems like it's kind of morphed more into sea life and things like that. But mm -hmm. yeah, it, it was very exciting. And it's still exciting today because there's been 20 years of evolution of this work. And uh you know, I keep trying to push it a little bit further, a little bit further. And, you know, as long as I'm having fun doing it and it seems to be received well in the industry or at these shows, uh, yeah, I'll keep doing it. I love the fact that you, you bring a little bit of fantasy to it, but mm -hmm. you bring fantasy to it within this this realm of a world that seems like it exists anyway, whether it's germs or spores or sea life or um, I just love kind of walking past your booth and seeing that that kind of I mean, you can tell you're having fun with it. It's It's purely original work, but it's like, you know, you can't just do abstract painting without learning how to draw. You have to learn how to, to, to hold on to the clay and, and, and work it and, and do these functional things almost, or, or, or figure out how the clay works before you can really say well, that's, that's exactly it. I think, you know, there's no shortcut to gaining the skill and the technique. Mm -hmm. And by making all these pots over the years, I really honed in on the skills and knew how to put things together. I understood the clay very well. Had I had these ideas when I first started out, it would have been a disaster. I just didn't wouldn't have had the skill set to carry it off and make it look like anything that was <laughs> that was worthy of being out there, you know? Right. So to right. be kind of more specific, like let's say you learn an effect from a glaze or whatever that you kind of file back in there and you're like, oh, I can use this technique in a more sculptural thing I'm trying to realize or something. Yeah, the main glaze that I actually use that is on the surface of almost everything I make is a glaze I developed probably five years before I ever used started doing this body of work. Mm. I was sort of using it, this crawl glaze that creates that nice kind of bumpy textured surface. I was kind of inlaying it in some of the carved things I was doing, but I was also using many other glazes at that time in a similar way, just with different color and textured effects. So when I actually started doing these organic pieces, it was the perfect surface for me to work with. Mm. But that in itself, that glaze is just white. It has no color to it. So I would figure out what underglazes I could use under it or over it, what oxides I could put with it. Because some things you'd think, oh, this is going to be a great color. And then you fire it up and all of it flaked off onto your shelf because it just wasn't compatible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, years and years of development to find out what works and what doesn't work and how to tweak it to make it work. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's a learning process. Mm -hmm. And I've got, you know, really good control of what I'm doing now. But when I want to introduce a few new colors, it's a whole nother going back and testing and making sure it's going to react with the chemistry and the kiln and everything to, to make it actually come out. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of fun yeah. because you, you keep testing and pushing it and see where it can go. Well, what I like, yeah. like what Will said earlier, is it, it it's not like a literal... Like you said, initially you started with like fruit and vegetable type forms or whatever. 
So it's not like a literal reflection of a pear or whatever. It's not something that exists, but it has elements that exist already in nature or in science or whatever. And so it seems like it's this whole new thing, but it's inspired from something else. And I, I love that that sets the viewer's mind wild to be like, oh, this is like a whole different thing, you know? I think that's really cool. Yeah, they. I think the human nature or the viewer typically wants to identify with it. They want to relate to something that is in some, something of their knowledge, something they've seen before. But it kind of gives them, you know, this intrigue or it has this mystery about it to where, you know, when they start really looking at it, they're like, well, yeah, this isn't sort of like that, but it's not really that at all. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it's it. I think it makes the viewer really kind of considerate for what it is, and you know whether they can put a label on it. I think the majority of people, their first thought is, "Well, this looks like sea life." But when you actually look at it, it it kind of resembles it in some ways. It has some of the elements of it, but it's really, you know, when you take a close look at it, it's not really that at all. So, do you ever study, uh, or just just pick up science books and and look through different? Just that uh, things for inspiration. Pictures. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have a really good book on seeds, you know, and book on pollen that I used yeah. to use quite often when I was sort of first developing my work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the last probably 10 years, I don't use a lot of visual references. I think my work, I, I get ideas from my own work okay. now. It's like I can take this idea and I can combine it with another idea that I've been doing uh, and somehow figure out a way to create a new piece with some of those elements, taking from this, taking from that, but then somehow synthesizing that together and, you know, see where it goes. And oftentimes it creates a whole new avenue for me to explore. I love that. Yeah. yeah. I, drawing inspiration from your own work. That's kind of inspirational to me too, just kind of thinking about, I don't know, figuring out new, new directions to go in. And, and cause sometimes I'll just go back and look through old ideas and realize that they weren't quite taken far enough or I could take them where I'm more skilled now, just kind of kind of drawing from, you yeah, know, it's, it's like now I'm, I'm more capable of saying what I want to say, I guess. Yeah, I, I agree. I, you know, it was probably about six months ago, I had to deliver a piece to a client who had bought some work maybe eight or 10 years ago for me. And I didn't realize what they had bought. I, I walked in and I said, oh my God, I looked at a couple of these pieces that were sort of something I did as a, in a way, a trial or a test piece that I visited once. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of almost forgot I even made it. Okay, and wow. I had to look at it and go, wow, that, that's kind of cool. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so it's like, maybe I need to go back and sort of push that idea a little bit further. Yeah. So it, it, it's interesting because I've done a lot of different playing around with things. Sometimes I might not actually, and, and in the moment, think it's that great. And I put it at a show and it sells right away. And I kind of almost forget about it. And then when I was able to actually come across something, because I don't document very much of my work at all as far as photographs and things. I make a lot of work and, you know, it comes and goes and some pieces are similar. But when you have something that really kind of stands out from the pack and you're, you're kind of wondering, is this like really any good at all? And, and it's gone before you can really get any kind of feedback from it or even artists' opinions of what it looks like. Do you sometimes so. feel like it's like it's a fluke, like you sell that thing? And you're like, well, wait a minute. I mean, was it luck that this person bought it? Will it have mass appeal? Will other people like it? You know what I mean? It's almost like you didn't get enough time to spend with it. Well, that's true. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I was in someone's home and it and it really just, I could not even remember when I made that piece or, you know, it wasn't so drastically different from what I do, but it was different enough to where it really caught my attention. Okay. We're we're you know? getting too old not to document this stuff <laughs> now. Know. You gotta, <laughs> I, I do well, something now or just forget it. You're gonna have to use that <laughs> iPhone that has some ceramic dust up into <laughs> into the uh, microphone port you, there. <laughs> yeah, I, I need I need to put Daria to work to document a little bit more. Of my thing, well, before so. we go any further, we need to send out a huge shout out to Daria because thank you to her for making this whole thing happen. We did a little troubleshooting and we needed her help, didn't we? <laughs> well, you know, without her, I would probably not be sitting here right now talking to you guys. But... We all have our in-house tech support. That's, well, that, uh, yeah. Douglas's son, Oliver, got us going when we first started the podcast. Oh, that's was, cool. Yeah. 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 Very instrumental in, in, in getting 
figuring out where all the plugs go. I still don't right. know. Well, <laughs> Oliver, I'm pretty good sitting behind my potter's wheel, but put me on a computer and I, you know, if something <laughs> goes wrong, I can't fix it. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you on that. So uh, you you mentioned retiring. You were talking about retiring as far as with your teaching right. career. How long did you teach and do shows at the same time? Well, I taught for 30 years. Wow. And I was doing shows pretty much. I did a few shows when I first started teaching. Mm -hmm. When I first got my first teaching job, it was inner city Miami. I had never student taught. I, I was 22 years old. I wasn't into art at all at the time as far as like thinking about it as a career. So my wife started teaching theater at, at the age of 22. She was teaching high school. She's, and we had gotten married young. She said, well, why don't you go into teaching? And I was like, you know, I don't really think I'm the greatest student or anything. I don't know if teaching would be for me. She goes, well, you always like working with your hands. You like art. You like to build things. Why don't you uh, think about doing something like that? So I kind of listened to her and I enrolled in several different art studio classes and one being ceramic. Okay. And it was a hand building class. I got in there and I just kind of started seeing what people were making with clay and got really kind of excited about it. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of it all. So I continued on taking those classes and, and taking other design classes, learning about art a little bit. And uh, clay just was my thing. I really wanted to do this. So I got my teaching certificate. I got my degree, my Bachelor of Fine Arts with teaching. Although you're supposed to do a teaching, student teaching thing for like six months or whatever, before you go into the classroom. Okay. And she said, well, you can actually get a job without that. You don't really have to do that. So I went to the main person, Lilia Garcia in Miami, who's the head of Dade County Public Schools. And she got me a job in the inner city and put me right in there. And I was miserable. I had no idea how to run the <laughs> classroom. I was teaching all types of art. I was just trying to oh, survive. Wow. Okay. Did, they just, did they eat you alive? They were kind of eating me alive. They loved being in my class, but I really didn't have that great of control. I was a little too laid back, not a great disciplinarian. But anyway, I stuck it out. I was married. I wanted to make sure I wasn't a, you know, just a failure. So right. I stuck it out. And after three years of hard time in the inner city, I actually got a call saying there's a teaching job for just teaching ceramics across the county at another school. And I got over to do that. And that's when everything kind of turned around. I got to do exactly what I wanted to do. Okay. I started learning a little bit more about teaching. I started doing my own work a little bit in the school. I, I guess there were two or three years I only did like two or three art shows wow. local. I, I wasn't able to produce a lot of work. I was kind of, you know, working my way through trying to stay alive in the teaching thing. And then I got over there and I started making work. I started working with the kids. And that's kind of where it all kind of blossomed. So yeah. let me ask, at and first started, it seemed like, when you got into that career path, it was about teaching, making a living and whatever. So what I'm interested in is what made the leap to then do the shows when you already had this other job? Was it really like you felt more of this draw to selling your work and getting your work out into the public? Yeah, I think ultimately I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be someone that could produce art, sell it and make, you know, make a living from it. Okay. And early on, I didn't have this like enough talent or skill set or or whatever to get in there and actually feel like I could make a living. So the teaching was a way that I it didn't put pressure on me to actually have to make money doing shows. Mm -hmm. So I would make whatever I kind of wanted and uh, to the best of my ability and go take it out there to the shows and see what happened, see what kind of response I would get. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of early on doing a lot of raku firing and things like that because uh, I didn't know much about glazing and and this and that or really have any kind of voice. I was still kind of learning, you know, okay. how to get, how to make something. Well, you, you, you started doing those shows like you did a couple. And I mean, what I found to be, you know, when I first started doing my kind of this body of work, I, I was doing a different thing with my ex and, and then... You know, I did my own body of work and all of a sudden it gave it that salary boost. I was doing mm. what I wanted to do and it kind of boosted it. Did you kind of get a little taste early on too? Or you, eh, you know, I was not making enough money at, or on the first couple of years of doing shows, like really to feel like I was going to be able to contribute enough to my marriage and, you know, to, yeah. to really just be able to jump out there and do this. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I, I didn't really have the, the ability 
Right. I was watching people go to these shows, and that's why that when I was talking about earlier being envious, I saw artists that were out there doing this on the weekends. They were making enough money to survive and doing it, and I felt like I want to get there, but I I didn't really know how to get there exactly. Mm-hmm. So I continued on with teaching, and, and I think my talent kept rising up. So after about maybe eight or 10 years of making work from the very beginning, all of a sudden I started applying to shows like Coconut Grove and Cherry Creek and places. And I started getting into all these shows, wow, yeah. you know, and it was like, wow, you know, people were like, wow, you got into Cherry Creek, you know, you know, that's like a great thing. And I didn't really know at the time. I just heard it was a good show. You know, right. I think 1997 was the first year I went out there. And to me, I made a I thought I made a ton of money, but I think everyone around me probably made two or three times more than I did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but it was kind of like, all right, I might be able to do this for a living. Mm. But by that time, you know, I was already 12 years into teaching and I was like, we had a couple of kids already. And then I started weighing family life and art show life. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew I could make a living, but I didn't want to be hustling too much on the road all the time while my kids are growing up and I'm, I'm just trying to really make ends meet. So I, I wanted to continue to, to teach because it was stable and I could continue to develop my work and, you know, again, not have to make a lot of money from it mm-hmm. in order to support my family. But was that switch in mind? Was that like the long goal? Like at some point I'll be able to to do this because I won't that have the little pr- kids or I won't have that. Yeah. You know, that was kind of it. I, I after, you know, you've, you're 20 years in, you're kind of like, all right, I can do this. I can make a living. But now I've Oh, at 10 more years, I could retire and have a pension for the rest of my life. <laughs> okay, yeah. that was the next carrot. <laughs> the, yeah, the practical side of me, I, yeah, I would have kind of liked to have get out of the classroom because it, it was a grind. Yeah. You know, I was having fun doing the shows. I was, you know, making more money at that point than teaching, which, you know, teachers don't get paid a ton of money. But it was kind of nice having that income. I was able to put all my kids through college without them having to take out loans and I was contributing and doing what I wanted to do for my family and still being there for them, mm-hmm. you know? I'd be gone on the weekends, but during the week I was home and going to school just like they were. So, yeah, I worked hard. Yeah. You did work <laughs> no hard. That's incredible. It. And, it, you know, yeah. it's a little bit easier. I don't know if it's easier, but it's maybe yeah, the paycheck at, le- at least is is reliable. We're out there on the road and it's like, well, uh, my paycheck, <laughs> it, it rained the last three weekends, so no paycheck. <laughs> Um, exactly. You know, and I knew that was a possibility and I didn't want to, I guess I wanted to keep the stress off of what I was creating in a sense. Yeah. Like I knew in the end, yes, I'm making some money from what I'm doing, but is that going to continue? Is that going to last? So mm-hmm. when I, when I finally did retire in 2017, I had this whole weight lifted off my shoulders. And when I found out how much I was going to have to pay for insurance after that, uh, you know, my oh, wife man. retired, we retired on the same day. Oh. It was like, wow, that's going to take a big chunk of our pension right there just to mm-hmm. pay for health insurance. Right. And we know where we're at with our, our with, you know, retiring from the teaching profession. Mm-hmm. So it was still a little bit of pressure in a way because we we're 55, but it was like, eh, let's do it. And and then ever since, I've, I've just really enjoyed doing these shows. Mm-hmm. And I've been, you know, unbelievably happy and grateful and people are supporting me and you know, life is grand for me right now. I got to be honest with you. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah I love hearing that. Yeah. Bill. That's really, really cool. I wanted to ask you, this is, you said something about kind of being around Florida. And I think there's something really attractive to the fact that like you, you talk about being able to stick around your own home state. And I'm, I'm jealous of, of that because I do so much traveling. And I, I know there's a huge art market that I haven't tapped here in Santa Fe. That was the whole point. I just sit here in my studio and still travel 1700 miles to do these right. shows. Yeah. And it, you know, it does pull me away from family and, and it, it is hard. I guess my question is being in Florida and being influenced maybe by the, the ocean and the sea life and in your work, does that keep you from having to travel maybe as far as you necessarily have to? Can you make a living just in Florida, just doing those shows? You know, I can. And I think a lot of it's because I do have that pension. You know, if I really needed to, I could buckle down and survive off of that. Are you doing any shows outside of Florida or are you pretty much staying I just, the the last show I did out of Florida was in 2022, not that long ago. I did go out and do Cherry Creek and I did Rittenhouse Square. I did several shows, you know, that were pretty good 
distances to travel. And yeah. then I decided, well, you know what? I'm going to 2023. I'm not going to, out of Florida. I'm going to do shows from October through April mm -hmm. and just take six months off or five, five and a half months awesome. off. And I really had a great summer. I found I was sleeping, <laughs> sleeping better at night. Okay. You know, I wasn't even doing any work. I went out of my studio and I always took a break in the summer from doing any work period so I could refresh and get, you know, regroup. Mm -hmm kind of followed the school year basically with, with me working in my studio. So I, I always need that break. And that, that was when I would get on the road and do these out of state shows and take these long road trips. And I enjoyed that, mm -hmm. but I think I'm resolved to where I'm only going to stay in Florida. I, it's a good enough market for yeah. me with my work being the way it is. You know, it doesn't work for everyone, but I can do well in other places, but I don't really need to chase it so much anymore. Yeah, that's I can, great. I'm happy I about that. I wondered because I, I remember seeing you like we were longtime neighbors across the street from each other at like Lakefront or whatever. And I had I haven't seen you at some of those more national shows. And I was wondering if you were sticking around Florida. Yeah, I am. And and I, you know, sometimes I miss it when I know those shows are going on, but then I think back and I go, Well, I didn't have to drive three long days to get yeah. to that art show. And you know, they're definitely better quality shows as a whole. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, the potential is probably better to make more money in those places, but it also costs a lot more money to do for one thing. That's a and, great point. And that's what I wanted to, to hear you kind of talk on the fact that Douglas and I have kind of got into a little bit of a trap here where we talk about some of the, you know, the, the A show and this show and that. And, and the fact is you can make a living not doing that. You know, you don't have to do the show with a thousand dollar booth fee. You can do the show with the $200 booth fee without the hotels and maybe have a higher quality of life, you know, not doing all of the traveling necessarily. Yeah. It, it, you know, I think it, everyone wants to kind of, there's a little ego involved in every artist. You want to be able to say, oh yeah, I do Cherry Creek. I do this. I think that. it's huge. I think the ego thing is huge. And I've done pretty much all the shows that I ever wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, i I don't really have to prove anything to myself or maybe to anybody, if you want to put it that mm -hmm. way. And I can go to some of these little shows in Florida. They're a couple hours from home, maybe. Like you say, they're a couple hundred bucks, maybe $300 for a booth yeah. for the weekend. Very low cost. If it rained out, you're not like losing tons of money. <laughs> right. Sometimes you're a big fish in a small pond. You can actually make some money doing that. The thing about Absolutely. Florida, too, that's so amazing is that there's so much wealth up and down the coast there that, you know, you could show up at a, a show that maybe isn't registering as a top 10 or something. It's the customers. It's the customers that show up and you got the right thing. You make the right thing and they want it. And there you go. Well, you know, and in Florida, most of these folks live somewhere else. Right. Anyhow, they have their Florida home. They winter in Florida, but they live in St. Louis. They live in somewhere in the Midwest or, you know, Colorado even or wherever. Yeah. They just winter in Florida. So they've seen you in all these other places, and maybe they purchased the piece from me for their Florida home, even if they bought it in St. Louis. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, they could just buy it here and not have to worry about shipping it or anything. Yeah, I, we've all shipped to Florida outside of it and, and doing <laughs> yeah. these, these big shows. So yeah. I, one thing I wanted to ask you, which is always uncomfortable to talk about, is the awards. I mean, you're an award winner. You win top awards, the coconut grove festival this year by the way congratulations best in show that's oh, amazing yeah that was that was unbelievable i was not expecting that at all <laughs> it wasn't unbelievable to the rest to of any us any of us little. right well, uh, no, <laughs> we're like okay you. cool I, you know, <laughs> that, that makes, makes sense total sense. Good. well it makes sense to are, us you guys are very kind i appreciate but that. i guess you know the thing i think about that is some people that's kind of like I don't know, a little bit the background might be their business model, like going to some of the shows like, say, Winter Park or Gasparilla, where they have those big prize money shows. You know what I mean? Do, do those kind of register on your radar because they have such great prize money? Uh, Not as much the bigger ones, but believe it or not, the smaller ones. There's mm. some shows in Florida that have $5,000 bested show and some of these B shows that that's the same as Coconut Grove. Mm. Five thousand dollar best. Okay, show. you're gonna get a bunch of people poaching your schedule. You better watch <laughs> out. Well, you know what? Bring it on. I, yeah, <laughs> I've already told other artists. You know, okay, I, I wouldn't recommend you traveling too far to do this show. But hey, there there is pretty good prize money, and you know, if you're here, yeah, may as well give it a try. You know, definitely. There's you know, there's just such a small handful of collectors in some of these places. So 
it could be hit or miss. You could actually show up at some of these little places where you wouldn't expect to make any money and you know, you you sell to three or four people and you it could make make your show. Yeah. And then if you win a nice prize on top of that, it's uh it can be pretty good. Definitely. If you can pull a cherry creek out of a cracker barrel parking lot, more power right. to you, you know. Just just do it. <laughs> screw the you ego sh- and fill those yeah, pockets screw full of gas. Screw, <laughs> screw the ego and just uh yeah. It's uh it's all right. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. I was really interested in learning about that kind of uh how you make a living just in your own home state. And um and not doing the traveling and letting some of those bigger shows kind of come to you and yeah I I I, I find that really appealing the uh, the more happily married I am the more I want to stay home with <laughs> my wife and <laughs> and not travel so just just try to try to figure well, it you, out I don't know if you want to live in Florida but you know <laughs> there's so many shows in Florida and, you yeah. know like I said I have to it might change. not be the market for everyone but it does work for me so. that's awesome yeah. Yeah. So you were talking about like science earlier, like some of your imagery kind of comes back to that. Do you have an interest in science or a background in science, or is it just that there's something about it that just really works for what you want to create? Eh, you know, it's, I would say it's more like the way, for the most part, the way nature kind of creates in a, its own science in a way, a lot of repetition of forms mm. and, you know, I th- some of my more complicated looking forms are just based on one simple idea that's just, you know, these forms that are put together over and over and over and over and over again, to where it creates this whole beautiful large form, but it's all kind of like, like a way, like barnacles colonize, mm. you know, it's like one barnacle might not be that interesting, but when you see a whole cluster of them all colonized together, it creates this really kind of elaborate pattern, mm. you know. It's kind of science, but it's a little more nature. Okay. You know, and some of the ways I put some of these forms together, it's going back to more of a science or engineering approach. It's kind of like the way a geodesic dome is put together. I have a, a cone that's supported by another cone, another cone. So every every little cone that's that's put together has about five or six different support groups. So it creates this really strong structural form when it's all mm-hmm. built without any kind of substructure inside of it. Cool. So you're not turning at all. You're you're sculpting. I well, I'm throwing a lot of forms on the wheel to create these like hollow cones or okay. spheres or whatever. I'm just putting a lot of forms together. Interesting. So I'm I'm some of them I'm cutting in half, but using the wheel as a tool to make hollow forms quickly because I mm. can. I've been throwing for forty years, so it's it's a very easy skill for me. It's faster than pouring flip into a mold or something to create a sphere, I can just throw the form, you know, wow. it doesn't take that long. Technologically speaking, uh, when you create those kind of hollow forms and can you attach multiple pieces with, and then do you have to glaze everything at once or do you, do you kind of attach them after there? I, I actually build the whole form as one. Okay. It goes in the kill and gets best fired. And then I do all the glaze work and fire it a second time. So, okay. yeah, it's all put together before, before it goes, you know, before it does any kind of color or anything. Interesting. Do you have like a whole setup of, of, you know, just, just your tan drying creations just uh, before you? Well, you know, I work on multiple things at a time. Sure. Uh, the other day we had really low humidity. I was working in my studio. So I was able to get all these things started and go back to them quick because they're going to start drying out a lot. And, th- you know, this is Florida, so I'm used to high humidity. Mm-hmm. It, we, we, a couple of days later, everything, the atmosphere changed. We had some little bit of rain moved in. I could get all this stuff started and nothing would dry at all because I have an open air studio. My, my studio has three sides open completely to the elements on one oh, side. Cool. That's great. So there's no air conditioning or heating or anything. It's just natural. It's just a natural atmosphere, like a shed basically Yeah. in my, in my backyard. So I'm totally subjected to the elements. If it's 40 degrees outside, it's 40 degrees in my studio. Right. And if it's 90 degrees, it's 90 degrees. I find that degrees. too in our studio where it's yeah. a garage that is open, all windows and doors. So it's almost like we're outside. But weather changes, yeah. temperature changes, that affects, you know, the timing with the glass. And that's what you're explaining with what you got it, going it's, on. Yeah. It's, I remember the first time I, I think it was the first time I ever did Cherry Creek, I did an artist demonstration. Mm. This is before I was doing this organic work. I was just throwing these big jars and things. And I was doing a demo and talking to an audience, and I didn't even need to use like a heat gun to force dry anything. Every as I throw it, just talk for a minute. These pieces were drying out, and I could just continue throwing. And oh. and 
it was kind of it was amazing. I don't know if I could work in that environment. I, it's a I nightmare, really honestly. Uh, being in the yeah. in the in the desert and high altitude, and I I'm used to you know fifty three years old. I spent forty nine of those years in Virginia, mm. and and East Coast <laughs> yeah. like humidity and the humidity in in Virginia. I'm used to my acrylic just flowing. Yeah, right. I'm, right. I'm up here in the desert. It's drying on my brush. While I'm moving it, and I'm like throwing away all these brushes, and I'm like, "What the hell?" I couldn't get. It took me forever to figure out the it's, different. Kind yeah, of, it's it's unbelievable yeah. how it really affects the medium <laughs> it, you're working with. Definitely, yeah. it's why they paint an oil up here in the in uh, Santa Fe. <laughs> exactly. You have to get all hoity toity. Got to yeah. paint with my pinky out though. <laughs> well, a conversation I had earlier this year with another artist. I was next to them at an art show. And they're an artist who does art shows and also teach kind of like how you did as well. They made a comment when they realized that, you know, I was part of the podcast. And he said to me that perhaps an artist who does this full time and makes a living off of their art or whatever, or struggles to make a living off their art, might look down on somebody who has kind of this other career. Have you ever experienced anything like that, that pressure or that feeling? Because for sure, we've talked on the podcast that we don't feel that way, you know, that however anyone can craft a life being an artist with whatever other means to support themselves, that that's important. The good thing is that you're doing what works for you. But I guess my question is, did you ever have any pressure with that? And don't uh, let the, you know, don't let the fact that Douglas asked the question and then answered it for, it's, <laughs> for you. It's the way your answer. You answer the way you. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, I put words. No, I'm, I'm never, teasing you. I'm teasing you. Yeah. Well, you know, I I think when things were really good for a lot of artists, yeah. I think they had a little bit more of a air over me, like, oh, you're teaching, and you know, right. you know, they're making a lot of money, so they don't need to teach. And then things got a little thin for some of them, mm -hmm. and then they would some of them would be like, wow, you're so lucky you have a teaching job right <laughs> now, and kind of like, well, I would always kind of say, well, it's really not luck. I really work pretty hard. Definitely, you know? yeah. um, I'm doing two jobs. I'm I'm working double time because I really want I want the stable income, mm -hmm. but I also want to be an artist. And and so many of my teacher friends, they never did their own work because they said, "Ah, oh, I don't have the time." So I like I said, I ran my classroom like it was a university. I would get the kids going on things, I would demonstrate. You know, the first 10 years I would throw these forms on the wheel, and then I would cut them in half, and the kids would be like gasping, oh, my God. And then after a while, I said, yeah, why am I cutting this thing in half? I could keep it, <laughs> you yeah. know, and I could actually turn it into something. Yeah. So right. I stopped trashing all my demonstrations and started, like, uh, saving them, you know, and realized there's no reason I need to do this just for the shock value to the kids. I may as well <laughs> take yeah. it. Yeah. Do you know, I, I admire that, too, because I, I always loved those kind of teachers that that – You'd go into the classroom and you'd learn by example and they'd be just working, you mm -hmm. know, and they're working and then, you know, they're moving around and they're, they're teaching too. But at the same time, it's like, give you yeah, a little I mean, bit of freedom. The, and the you know, you're going to learn so much more if you can watch someone that kind of knows what they're doing with the material and see how they actually, uh, whether it's applying paint or, you know, just sculpting something. If they explain it to you and give you one little demo and then you're on your own. You have nothing to re reference back to, but if you can go back and go, oh yeah, I see how you add that texture to this or doing that. And I was totally open. My my workstation was right in the classroom. I wasn't hiding off in another room or anything. I was working right there with the kids. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it was kind of fun. I, I could sit back, like I'd say, especially on Monday mornings, the kids would all walk in and they would just start getting their materials, getting all their stuff, start working. I didn't even have to sit them down and take attendance. I would saw them come in, they, they'd be working and it was just flowing. So it was kind of a nice thing. They, they respected my space and I respected them and it was a, it was a good career. What's it like teaching like that age group? They were in your classes because it was an elective, you know, they didn't, they didn't have to be there. It's not like math or English or whatever. So if, by definition, you might have kids that are a little more interested in art and wanting to learn. Well, you you got to mix because they did have to have a fine art credit. So a lot of them took it because they knew about my classroom and how it was run. It was kind of open. They didn't have a lot of, you know, restrictions put on them. They had a lot, of, you know, they could talk, they could move around, they could interact with each other. So rather than 
take a class where they're, you know, they have to sit in their chair and listen to the teacher lecture or this and that. I think they, they like that. And some of them found their way with clay and found that they really did like making things. Mm -hmm. The biggest downfall in teaching, probably across the board almost, especially in creative arts was, you know, when the kids all started getting cell phones, you mm -hmm. know, then that became what they wanted to play with in their hands rather than clay. And I saw a real transition when the cell phone really became dominant and kids would have anxiety if you took it away from them, it really kind of changed the dynamics of teaching. And fortunately, I only had to witness that for probably the last maybe one third of my teaching career because I just saw it really, you know, it really was kind of a sad thing for kids that didn't have any distractions. Here's the clay. This, this is what we have to work with. There's not another tool we can play around with. And now post COVID, really the classroom is even harder for teachers. I mean, I'm hearing oh, about teachers goodness. getting out of the whole field altogether. It's just too hard. Yeah, it's it really is not a good place to be right now, unfortunately. But well, hopefully heartbreaking. there's still some that are sticking it out because we need mm -hmm. them. Yeah, I hated that when, Douglas, when you came back from that show, I know the artist that you're talking about, and we actually uh, want to collect his work because we really respond to his work. And I hated that because it's like I, I really do feel that however – you make this work as an artist is admirable. And I love hearing about your story, Bill, and and being able to be a teacher for so many years and travel at your own rules and in your own way to make your own living. You know, the way Daryl Thetford talked early on in the show about doing as few shows as possible. And yeah, he and Dolan Guyman had a little contest to see how few shows they could do during a year. <laughs> You know, and and that's yeah. admirable for those guys, and that's a totally different business model, maybe than than yeah. the hustle. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, I I just I like the way that the the teachers teach, and I don't know the way that that kind of answers back to our own industry. Yeah, you know, it's probably good that I wasn't good enough early <laughs> on to make a living. <laughs> Because that kind of made me stay in the classroom longer. And once you reach a certain point, you're kind of like, I can't give up this carrot at the end of all this and have some kind of income. Absolutely. You know, what if something happens? What if I get in an accident and I lose use of a hand or something? You know, you, you kind of, you don't want to think about that, but it's a possibility, you know, and then I don't want to be someone on disability or whatever, trying to live off the government. Mm -hmm. I want to. I want to make my own way, you know? Right. <laughs> Another thing that I think of when I think of your work is how you display your work. You know, you walk through an art show and you see pro panel, pro panel, pro panel, and then you'd walk in and your work fits in the environment that you've created. These hard walls with a very unique color to what you'd see in any other booths. Can you talk about your kind of the decision to make your booth stand out to help make your work stand out? Yeah. You know, I've, I guess I created this booth, I think it was 2002. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. And actually, not the wall color, but w when I was thinking about the pedestal design, mm -hmm. I was literally going on a summer trip and I had very limited space in my van. I was doing four shows, Cherry Creek and Des Moines, Ann Arbor and all these things where I needed to carry as much work as possible. And my pedestals, I'm trying to figure out a way to make them really small and compact. So I actually make them out of cardboard boxes. I built mm. a really nice top and a really nice bottom. And, and my, the idea was, well, if I can get through the summer with these four shows and this display works and it, and it only makes it through there and I trash it, then I'll figure something out after that. Okay. And here it is 22 years later and I'm still basically using the same display. I've only replaced <laughs> the cardboard twice. Wow. Are you serious? Years. And they're literally just boxes, you know? Wow. Was, it's been like, unbelievably, I don't know if it's luck, I spray painted them with the cheapest spray paint I could find to make them black and built really nice looking countertops. The wall color, I just got lucky. I wanted something other than white. And I knew I wanted sort of a reddish color. Yeah. And I just walked in, I looked at all these different paint chips, I picked one and it was kind of the one that seemed to really work. I mean, there may be other ones that work equally as well. But I found the one I it seemed to be the perfect backdrop for my work and and i've been using it ever since it fits i mean it so, fits it so well it's like it's the right environment to showcase your work yeah i mean it's a like a perfect complement to all the different colors so i think about when it's a little bit of luck <laughs> when i talked sure. to eric lee a couple of years ago and he said what was so important to him when he got on the art fair scene was that he wanted to create a booth that was 
distinguishable from anybody else, his work, but also like the booth itself. It's like, oh, that's the booth that had like the furniture in it or whatever. You know, it's your booth has got the unique color and it brings them back to the whole picture of your booth and your work. And I think that was a really important decision that you made to do something different than what other people are doing. It's like a branding, right. really, right? I mean, isn't that that what you're going for? Yeah, you know, like I said, I wasn't really thinking about as much standing out from other people as I was just trying to make my work stand out. And I think it did both. I think, like you said, you, you look at so many booths, they're either pro panels that are sometimes black, sometimes beige, sometimes gray. The booth itself doesn't stand out, you know? Mm -hmm. And you have other artists, you know, like uh, Tony Cray. He has a beautiful booth. Yep. As a oh, right. Blower. It's another you know, good he example. Paints, he's got a, this really bright yellow that he's using that just looks dynamite in there. Right. You know, you know and it's, his, his booth's always super clean and really well put together, and it sets off his work great. Yeah. So, I think it's a really a good of, idea to do that, to make your display fit the work and showcase the work, but yet be distinguishable from anybody else. So yeah. I cool. agree. I agree. Cool. Well, Bill, this has been awesome. It's really cool to hear your story over the years of being a teacher, being on the road and what, what you find inspiration from. So thanks for doing that with us. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. It, it's a valuable uh, kind of lessons here that you've kind of taught us and just really honestly nice to get to know you a little bit better. So thank you. Well, I really appreciate you guys having me on and Hopefully I said a few things you can actually. <laughs> <laughs> Something we can air. <laughs> actually, you can share with some other people <laughs> worthy of. And I look forward to seeing both of you guys in person at, yes. a, at a show. Well, of course, you'll have to come to Florida now. So well, I don't know if that's happening. I'm back, baby. I'm, I got that Florida monkey. I'm going to feed him another cup of coffee next chance I get. So maybe we'll see you down there. It uh, looks like Florida 2025 is back on for me. I had to take two years off of Florida. But um, okay. I'll, I'll right. fill you in later. Everyone who listens to the show knows why I had to do that, but I'll fill you in <laughs> later on. So. Okay. Sounds good. Watch us not get in now. Nobody's getting in. All right. There you go. Bye, Bill. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Right. Take, Take care. care. Bye-bye. He's gone, right, Will? He's, he's, he's yeah, not... we can talk about him. Now we let's, can talk. Uh, let's do it. All right. Let's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And we can tell him how we really feel. <laughs> no, nah, man, that, what a good, good guy. I mean, just a legend in Holy. our industry. So It's crazy uh, him talking about retiring from teaching he doesn't seem to be of that age that he could be retired i mean he looks great and it's pretty amazing he does and it's isn't that more of like a number of years thing as opposed to an age so so he can just he started teaching when he was like nine ten years old that's exactly so, right yeah that's he right can just keep it going <laughs> but no it, it made me think about what we talked about in the preamble about the series i was watching about health and all that kind of stuff and I right. found it fascinating what they talked about on, in this series about epigenetics, which it's a new term for me. I hadn't heard it new, before. New to me. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to the Google machine. I don't know what the yeah. what you're talking about. Well, right. genetics is the thing that we inherit from our parents and the DNA. You know, we get our, right. you know, high blood pressure, cholesterol, all that kind of stuff. But the epigenetics is our choices that we make that can either delay those markers getting turned on or enhance them or make them speed up. So mm. that's been my focus ever since I saw that that series, that I want to slow down all those things that are in my future and put them off, you know, as far as I can, put them off in the yeah. distance. <laughs> I've actually decided, I'm, I've got a new thing I'm going to start up. I've, the You know, the, the fall show announcements are coming out, the late summer announcements are coming out. So I've taken up smoking. I, uh, oh, well, I don't know go. if you, if you, <laughs> so anybody wants a cancer stick, I'm your hillbilly. Uh, no, no smoking. That'll be but, good uh, for the high blood pressure. You said that you were uh, going in to have tests for this week. Sure, sure. <laughs> Why not? Uh, it's, uh, chest pains. Watch me have a heart attack and then everybody go back to this episode. There oh, fantastic. That's just <laughs> great. I got my, uh, I don't know if you can see this here, Douglas, but I've got my, I've, I'm going back to Des Moines this year. I'm excited about going back. I've got my Fong's kick-ass pizza t-shirt on. Amazing. Uh, so I'm always already. You ever, do you, uh, talking about going out to uh, favorite spots after shows, do you, have you ever been to Fong's? I have not. Oh man. It's a, it's a Chinese food pizza place and it's Interesting. like they do like crab rangoon and 
um, those kind of pizzas and like Chinese food pizzas. It's a really quirky, fun spot, and it's got a killer beer list if you're into that kind of thing. Is it in the neighborhood of the show? So it's like if you're walking from the Marriott to the Papajan Sculpture Park where the, the show site is, if you walk about the same distance in the other direction, you can get down there, but it's it's walking distance. And, okay. Um, you'll see a million artists in there and, and um you just show up, you'll you'll already have a table. It'll be like, Oh my god, it's Douglas uh, and he's a yeah. goddamn and celebrity. Walking just, distance for whom, Mr. Armstrong? <laughs> I put my foot in my mouth again by saying foot in my mouth. I am going to stop. Thanks for tuning in to another podcast. Uh, Really enjoy your listenership. Special thanks go out to Jeff Zachman this week for kicking us a little bit of funding, helping the keep the wheels on the wagon. Once again, Uh, if you feel so inclined, you uh, are enjoying the show. You want to drop something in the bucket. Get your name on the podcast. Uh, That's the way it's not fun. Drive week, but um, it is always appreciated. How about that? That's good. That's right. Uh, Yeah, so one more thing before we wrap up here for this week's episode, and that is, um, I'm happy to say I'm going to be back on the road coming up here. So we're going to be gone, both Will and I, solid for a couple of weeks here in a row. With us being gone for a long period of time, you'll probably experience some irregularity with your normally (laughs) regularly scheduled (laughs) podcast. (laughs) Uh, So uh, we're trying to be as regular as we can, but we're 53-year-old men, and uh, we do the best we can, and and we'll do what we can. You know, a good way to be able to follow us when new episodes drop is to go on to your, your app, your podcast app, hit subscribe, and then when the new episodes come... It just shows right up there on your phone. You get a notification. We will talk to you when, Douglas. Who gives a shit? Who we'll knows? see you on the road. We'll figure it out when we get home. Stop by and see us, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Bye-bye, everyone. This podcast is brought to you by the National Association of Independent Artists. The website is naiaartists.org. Also sponsored by Zapplication. That's zapplication.org. And while you're at it, find us on social media and engage in these conversations. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast to be notified when we release new episodes. Oh, and if you like the show, we'd love it if you would give us your five-star rating and offer up your most creative review on your podcast streaming service. See you next time.